And the single, single most important thing to me in the stock market for anyone is to know what you own. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. They, they would not be able to tell you why they own it. They couldn't say in a minute or less why they own it. Actually, if you really press them down, they'd say the reason I own this is the sucker's going up. I mean, that's the only reason. <laughs> that's the only reason they own it. And if you can't explain, I'm serious, you can't explain to a 10-year-old in two minutes or less why you own a stock, you shouldn't own it. And that's true, I think, about 80% of people that own stocks. And this is the kind of stock people like to own. This is the kind of company people adore owning. It's a relatively simple company. They make a, a very uh, narrow, easy to understand product. They make a one megabit SRAM, CMOS, bipolar risk, floating point, data IO, IO array processor, with an optimizing compiler, a 16 dual port memory, a double diffused metal oxide semiconductor monolithic logic chip with a plasma matrix vacuum fluorescent display. It has a 16-bit dual memory. It has a Unix operating system, four whetstone megaflop polysilicon emitter, a high bandwidth, that's very important, six gigahertz, <laughs> double metallization communication protocol, an asynchronous backward compatibility, peripheral bus architecture, four-wave interleaved memory, a token ring and change backplane, and it does it in 15 nanoseconds of capability. Now, if you own a piece of crap like that, <laughs> you will never make money. Never. Somebody will come along with more whetstones or less whetstones or a bigger mega flop or a smaller mega flop. You won't have the foggiest idea what's happened. And people buy this junk all the time. I made money in Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I can understand it. I, uh, when there was recessions, I didn't have to worry about what was happening. I could go there and people were still there. I didn't have to worry about low-priced Korean imports. I mean, I just didn't have, you know, I can understand it. And you laugh, I made 10 or 15 times my money in Dunkin' Donuts. Those are the kind of stocks I can understand. If you don't understand it, it doesn't work. This is the single biggest principle. And it bothers me that people are very careful of their money. The public, when they buy a refrigerator, they get a consumer reports, they buy a microwave oven, they do that. They ask people what's the best kind of radar range or, they, or what kind of car to buy. They do research on apartments. When they, go to, when they go on a trip to Wyoming, they get the mobile travel guide or California. When they go to Europe, they get the Michelin travel guide. People will hear a tip on a bus on some stock and they'll put half their life savings <laughs> in it before sunset and they wonder why they lose money in the stock market. And when they lose money, they blame it on the institutions and program trading. That is garbage. They didn't do any research. They bought a piece of junk. They didn't look at the balance sheet. And that's what you get for it. And that's what we were being driven to. And it's self-fulfilling. The public does terrible investing, and they, they say they don't have a chance. It's because that's the, way they're, that's the way they're acting. I'm trying to convince people there is a method. There are reasons for stocks that go up. Uh, Coca-Cola, this is very magic. It's a very magic number. Easy to remember. Coca-Cola is earning 30 times per share what they did 32 years ago. The stock has gone up 30-fold. Bethlehem Steel is earning less than they did 30 years ago. The stock is half its price of 30 years ago. Stocks are not lottery tickets. There's a company behind every stock. If a company does well, the stock does well. It's not that complicated. People get too carried away. And first of all, they try and predict the stock market. That is a total waste of time. No one can predict the stock market. They try to predict the interest rates. I mean, this is a, if anybody would predict interest rates right three times in a row, they'd be a billionaire. Considering there's not that many billionaires on the planet, it's very, you know, I took, I had logic, so I had a syllogism in the uh, study of these when I was at Boston College. There can't be that many people who can predict the interest rates because there'd be lots of billionaires. And no one can predict the economy. I had a lot of people in this room were around in 1981 and 82 when we had a 20% prime rate with double-digit inflation, double-digit uh, unemployment. I don't remember anybody telling me in 1981 about it. I didn't read, I studied all this stuff. I don't remember anybody telling me we're gonna have the worst recession since the Depression. So what I'm trying to tell you, it'd be very useful to know what the stock market's gonna do. It'd be terrific to know that the Dow Jones average year from now would be X, that we're gonna have a full-scale recession, or interest rates gonna be 12%. That's useful stuff. You never know it, though. You just don't get to learn it. So I've always said, if you spend 14 minutes a year on economics, you've wasted 12 minutes. And I, I, I really believe that. Now, I have to be, I'd be fair, I'm talking about economics on the broad scale, predicting the downturn for next year or the upturn or M1 and M2, 3B and all these, all these M's. The, uh, 
I'm talking about economics to me is when you talk about scrap prices. When I own auto stocks, I want to know what's happening to used car prices. When used car prices are going up, it's a very good indicator. When I own hotel stocks, I want to know hotel occupancies. When I own chemical stocks, I want to know what's happening to the price of ethylene. These are facts. If aluminum inventories go down five straight months, that's relevant. I can deal with that. Home affordability, I want to know about that. when I own uh, Fannie Mae or I own a housing stock. These are facts. You can, they're economic facts and it's economic predictions. And economic predictions are a total waste. And uh, interest rates, Alan Greenspan is a very honest guy. He would tell you that he can't predict interest rates. He could tell you what short rates are going to do in the next six months. Try and stick them on what the long-term rate will be three years from now. They'll say, I don't have any idea. So how are you, the investor, supposed to predict interest rates if the head of the Federal Reserve can't do it? So I think that's, uh, but you should study history. And history is the important thing you learn from. What you learn from history is the market goes down. It goes down a lot. The math is simple. There's been 93 years a century. This is easy to do. The market's had 50 declines of 10% or more. So 50 declines in 93 years. About once every two years, the market falls 10%. We call that a correction. That means that's a euphemism for losing a lot of money rapidly. But we, you know, we call it a correction. And uh, uh, so. 50 declines in 93 years, about once every two years, the market falls 10%. Of those 50 declines, 15 have been 25% or more. That's known as a bear market. We've had 15 declines in 93 years. So every six years, the market's going to have a 25% decline. That's all you need to know. You need to know the market's going to go down sometime. If you're not ready for that, you shouldn't own stocks. And it's good when it happens. If you like a stock at 14 and it goes to 6, that's great. You understand the company, you look at the balance sheet, and they're doing fine. And you're hoping to get to 22 with it. 14 to 22 is terrific. 6 to 22 is exceptional. So you take advantage of these declines. They're going to happen. No one knows when they're going to happen. It would be very, people tell you about it after the fact that they predicted it, but they predicted it 53 times. And uh, <laughs> so you can take advantage of the volatility in the market if you understand what you own. Uh, so I think that's the key to element, another key element is that you have plenty of time. People are in an unbelievable rush to buy a stock. I'll give you an example of a well-known company. Walmart went public in October of 1970. 1970 went public. Already had a great record. It had 15 years performance, great balance sheet. You could have waited 10 years saying you're a very conservative investor. You're not sure this Walmart can make it. You want to check. You're, you're, you see them operate in small towns. You're afraid. They can only make it in seven or eight states. You want to wait till they go to more states. You keep waiting. You could have bought Walmart 10 years after it went public and made 35 times your money. If you bought it when they went public, you would have made 500 times your money. But you could have waited 10 years after Walmart went public and made uh, 30, over 30 times your money. You could wait three years after Microsoft went public and made 10 times your money. Now, if you knew something about software, I know nothing about software. If you knew something about software, you would have said, these guys have it. I don't care who's going to win, Compaq. IBM, I don't know who's going to win Japanese computers. I know Microsoft, MS-DOS is the right thing. You could have bought Microsoft. Again, I'm repeating myself, stocks are not a lottery ticket. There's a company behind every stock. And you, you can just watch it. You have plenty of time. People are in an amazing rush to purchase the security. They're out of breath when they call up. You don't need to do this. <laughs> it's, uh, the, uh, you need an edge to make money, too. People have incredible edges and they throw them away. I'll give you a quick example of uh, Smith Klein. This is a stock that, that had Tagamet. Now you didn't have to buy Smith Klein when Tagamet was doing clinical trials. You didn't have to buy Smith Klein when Tagamet was talked about in the New England Journal of Medicine or the British version Lancet. You could have bought Smith Klein when Tagamet first came out, a year after it came out. Let's say your spouse, your mother, your father, you were a nurse, you were a druggist, you're writing all these prescriptions. Tagamet was doing an amazing job of curing ulcers, and it was a wonderful pill for the company because if you just stopped taking it, the ulcer came back. See, it, wasn't, it would have been a crummy product that you took it for a buck and it went away, but it was a great product for the company. But you could have bought it two years after the product was on the market and made five or six times your money. I mean, all the druggists, all the nurses, all the people, millions of people saw this product, and they're out buying oil companies, you know, or drilling rigs, you know. It happens. And then three years later or four years later, Glaxo, even a bigger company, it's a huge company, a British company, brought out Zantac, 
which was a better, at that time, an improved product. And you could have seen that take market share do well. You could have bought Glaxo and triple your money. So you only need a few stocks in your lifetime. They're in your industry. I think of people, if you'd worked in the auto industry, let's say you're an auto dealer the last 10 years, you would have seen Chrysler come up in the minivan. You'd seen, if you're a Buick dealer, a Toyota dealer, a Honda dealer, you would have seen the Chrysler dealership packed with people. You could have made 10 times your money on Chrysler a year after the, the minivan came out. Ford introduces the Taurus Sable, the most successful line of cars in the last 20 years. Ford went up sevenfold on the Taurus Sable. So if you're a car dealer, you only need to buy a few stocks every decade. When your lifetime's over, you don't need a lot of five baggers to make a lot of money starting with $10,000 or $5,000. So in your own industry, you're gonna see a lot of stocks and that's what bothers me. There are good stocks out there looking for you and people just aren't listening and they're just not watching it. And uh, they have incredible edges. People have big edges over me. <clears throat> they work in the aluminum industry. I see aluminum industry is coming down, inventory is coming down six straight months. They see demand improving. In America today, you know, you know, it's hard to get an EPA permit for a bowling alley, never mind an aluminum smelter. So you know when aluminum gets tight, you just can't build seven aluminum smelters. So when, when you see this coming, you can say, wait a second, I can make some money. When an industry goes from terrible to mediocre, the stock goes north. When it goes from mediocre to good, the stock goes north. When it goes from good to terrific, the stock goes north. There's lots of ways to make money in your own industry. You can be a supplier in the industry, you can be a customer. This thing, this thing happens in the paper industry, it happens in the steel industry. It doesn't happen every week, but if you're in you're some field, you'll see a turn, you'll see something in the publishing industry. These things come along, and it, it's just mind-boggling, people throw it away. Uh, one, one of the things I find a rule, I, 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 a couple of rules I want to throw out <coughs> that I find useful, <coughs> excuse me, is a lot of times people buy on the basis, the stock has gone down this much, how, you know, how much further can it go down? I remember when Polaroid went from 130 to 100, people said, here's this great company, great record. If it ever gets below 100, you know, just buy every share, you know, and it did get below 100. A lot of people bought on that basis saying, look, it's gone from 135 to 100. It's not 95, what a buy. Within a year, it was 18. And this is a company with no debt. I mean, this is a company, it was just so overpriced, it went down. Uh, I did the same thing in my, uh, I think my first or second year of Fidelity. Kaiser Industries had gone from $26 a share to 16. I said, how much lower can it go? It's 16. So I think we bought one of the biggest blocks ever on the, New York, on the American Stock Exchange at Kaiser Industries at 14. I said, you know, it's gone from 26 to 16. How much lower can it go? Well, at 10, I called my mother and said, mom, you got to uh, look at this Kaiser Industries. I mean, how much lower can it go? It's gone from 26 to 10. <laughs> well, it went to six, it went to five, it went to four, it went to three. And uh, now, I under, fortunate this happened rapidly, or I would probably be still caddying or uh, being, you know, working at the stop and shop, but I, it happened fast, so I was able to, it was compressed. At, uh, and at three, I figured out, you know, there's something very wrong here, because Kaiser Industries owns 40% of Kaiser Steel, they own 40% of Kaiser Aluminum, they own 32% of Kaiser Cement, they own Kaiser Broadcasting, they own Kaiser Santa Gravel, Kaiser Engineers, they own Jeep, they own business after business, and they had no debt. Now, I learned this very early. This might be a breakthrough for some people. It's very hard to go bankrupt if you don't have any debt. It's, it's tricky. Some people can approach that. It's a, real, it's a real achievement. But they had no debt, and the whole company at three was selling at about $75 million. At that point, it was equal to buying one Boeing 747. I said, there's something wrong with this company selling for $75 million. I was a little premature at 16, but uh, I said, everything's fine, and eventually this will work out. And they, what they did is they gave away all their shares to their shareholders. They, they passed out shares in Kaiser Cement, they passed out shares in Kaiser Lunum, they passed out their public shares in Kaiser Steel, they sold all the other businesses, and you get about $50 a share. And, but if you didn't understand the company, if you're just buying on the fact the stock had gone from 26 to 16, and then it got to 10, what would you do when it went to nine? What would you do when it went to eight? What would you do when it went to seven? This is the problem that people have, is they sell stocks because they didn't know why they bought it, then it went down, and they don't know what to do now. Do you flip a coin? Do you walk around the block? You know, <laughs> what do you do? It's psychiatrists that haven't worked so far. I've never seen them running in. The, the, the psychological psychiatry fund I've never seen was, was for the, uh, with the SEC to make it through as a mutual fund. So I, they haven't seemed to help. Uh, I've tried prayer. That hasn't worked. The, uh, the, uh, so if you don't understand the company, you have this problem when they go down. 